We've talked about what big O means in terms of inequalities, but there's another interpretation as well. It's trash. Big O is like a cosmic trash can that has a specific size to the opening. There's certain stuff that fits in a big O trash can. And this interpretation as trash management is really one of the great benefits of working with Big O. Now, this is going to become clearer the more examples we do, the more we use Big O to understand different parts of calculus. But for now, let's just do a really simple example or two and see what we mean as far as trash management. Let's begin with a little bit of geometry. Let's take an object and change the size a little bit and see what happens. Let's begin by thinking about the area of a disk of radius r. You know the formula for that, pi r squared. Now, what happens when we change that r by a small amount, epsilon? And here we're going to work in the limit as epsilon is small, is going to zero. Now, this is not difficult. What is the area of a disk of radius r plus epsilon? Well, it's pi times quantity r plus epsilon squared. Let's multiply that out. The first term is pi r squared. The next term is, let's see, 2 pi times r times epsilon. And then the last term is, well, you know what? Let's just throw that in the trash. Let's just call that big O of epsilon squared. I mean, we know exactly what it is, right? We know what the coefficient in front of it is, but let's throw it in the trash. And let's think about what this really means. That big O epsilon squared term, when epsilon is small, that's really, really small. But the perturbation, the change in the area is going to be mostly controlled by that leading order term, the 2 pi r epsilon. Now you look at that and you think to yourself, oh wait, hey, 2 pi r, that's the circumference of the circle. And indeed, to leading order, the change in the area is controlled by the circumference. If you try to visualize what is happening by looking at the area of the disk and thinking about what happens if you change that radius by an amount epsilon, one way to do it is to put little tiny line segments all around the circumference and then just turn them into little boxes, little rectangles whose height is epsilon. That is that leading order term. Now, when epsilon is small, that gets most of the additional area, but not all of it. There's still a little tiny stuff left over that has to fill in the cracks. But that stuff is small. It is in big O of epsilon squared in the limit as epsilon goes to zero. Okay, let's redo this. Let's do this again, but for the volume of a ball. We know the formula for that, 4 thirds pi r cubed. We know how to do the algebra there. What happens when you increase or change the radius by epsilon? Epsilon could be negative, by the way. You get 4 thirds pi times quantity r plus epsilon cubed. Let's do the algebra. And what do we get? Let's see. We get 4 thirds pi r cubed, the volume of the ball. And then the next term is 4 thirds pi times 3 r squared epsilon. That simplifies to 4 pi r squared epsilon. And then we keep going, but I'm tired of doing algebra. I'm going to throw all the rest of the terms into big O epsilon squared. Now, of course, one of those terms is an epsilon squared, the other one is an epsilon cubed, but they all fit in to a big O epsilon squared trash can. And once again, we can see that the leading order term in the perturbation to the volume is really the surface area of the ball times epsilon. And we can think the same way that we thought before. I take this sphere and I've got all these little surface area patches. I can expand those out to little solid prisms of height epsilon, and that's most of the change in volume. Now, there's leftover stuff, but in the limit as epsilon goes to zero, that stuff is of order epsilon squared. Now, if we wanted to be clever, we could break out those terms into those that are of order epsilon squared and then those that are of order epsilon cubed. 
And in fact, this is a very good way to visualize the Taylor series in epsilon about epsilon equals zero in this case. But the main story, the thing we're getting at, is that you can just put it all in a big O epsilon trash can. Okay, that was some geometry. Let's keep going. Let's do a little physics. What happens when you've got an object and you perturb its velocity, let's say? Let's say you've got an object, it's got a known mass, but it's moving at some velocity. You measure that velocity and you just get an estimate for it. We're going to again work in the limit as epsilon goes to zero. And with an epsilon amount of change in velocity, what can you say about the momentum? Recall the momentum, P, is the mass, M, times the velocity, V. Well, P of V plus epsilon is M times V plus epsilon. That's MV, the momentum, plus M times epsilon. That means that your uncertainty in the momentum scales with the mass times the uncertainty in the velocity. Okay, no big deal there. But what about the kinetic energy? Recall the kinetic energy K is one half MV squared. Aha, if I perturb the velocity by an amount epsilon, the kinetic energy changes as one half m times quantity v plus epsilon squared. That's one half mv squared, the kinetic energy, plus, let's see, one half m times two times v times epsilon. That's mv times epsilon. And then the last term is big O epsilon squared. So what we see, similar to what we saw before, is that the uncertainty in the kinetic energy to first order scales with the uncertainty in the velocity by the momentum, m times v. That's an interesting perspective. That's not the way that you're used to thinking about things, probably. Remember this when we get to the next chapter. But for now, really what we just want to get across is that Big O is a convenient trash can for throwing away stuff that doesn't matter and focusing on stuff that does.